Um, welcome everyone uh, to this third in the series of research ethics webinars hosted by the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. Um, I think a number of you are new registrants, so we had a recent um, uh, email blast uh, that reached, I think, more, more folks, so glad you could make it. Uh, so I'll kind of um, uh, give you some contextual information about this series. Uh, one thing to note, uh, as you might see as you enter, this session is being recorded. Um, this is uh, for the purpose of, uh, of dissemination. Actually, the first record, the recording of the first session, which some of you might have missed, is already available online. I think uh, you had an email that, that gave a link to that. We'll upload the second session um, that happened two weeks ago. Um, uh, also to our, our, our YouTube channel, um, again, for those that, that might have missed that session. Those two sessions were, I think, quite interesting. Um, uh, the first uh, session um, that I had with myself and uh, Dr. Jerry Menikoff um, that concerned the nature of research and what is and isn't, what it is and is not research. Uh, and then the second session with uh, Dr. Menikoff and uh, Professor Savalescu. Uh, they went into, I think, so, well, some very interesting uh, uh, case studies relating to risk. Uh, and uh, well, particularly, uh, Jerry has uh, some experience with the support trial that attracted some controversy. And I think that really well illustrated uh, some of the issues with uh, classifying uh, minimal risk in certain ways and, and the consequences of doing so inappropriately. Uh, so yeah, so the, those videos are going to be made available and we're recording this session for similar purpose. Uh, for those that um, uh, miss this session, they're able to view uh, the session online uh, afterwards. So today's session uh, is going to be on a different topic. It's going to be on, as the uh, materials uh, circulated suggested, on scientific validity. Uh, and so the previous time we had uh, two talks back to back. This one will be one slightly longer talk. So I'll be speaking for, I'll try to keep it around 40 minutes, so plus or minus, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then we have time afterwards for Q&A, uh, depending on um, uh, your preference. During Q&A, you could either type your questions in the chat, and you could do that as we go along, um, as, as questions arise, uh, or at the end. Uh, you can also, at the end, uh, be using the raise hand function. This is a general Zoom room, and you can raise your hand, and uh, we can call on you, and, and we can, you can unmute yourself that way, whichever is, is preferable. Um, okay, with those, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so, and, and this session is part of a four-part series. Uh, the fourth session happening in two weeks, uh, we'll have again um, uh, Dr. Jerry Menikoff uh, to give his great insights, uh, as well as Dr. Sumitra Menon on the issues of inducement payments, uh, uh, undue influence, and related concerns. Um, so yeah, and that, that fourth set of webinar will round out this particular series, but we will return to these sorts of events uh, probably in the new year, uh, new semester, new year, uh, with some other maybe face-to-face -face events as well. So this won't be, this is uh, this is just um, this maybe semester's tranche of events from CBME uh, on this particular topics, but there's more to come. Um, yeah, so just by way of introduction for myself, uh, for those that uh, missed the last uh, first and second sessions, I'm an assistant professor at the Center for Biomedical Ethics. Uh, I work on a variety of areas related to the uh, research ethics and the development of novel biotechnologies, um, including uh, issues of, of uh, consent, uh, uh, data, uh, and uh, this concept of the public interest um, I have recently gotten some, uh, some investigation into. And uh, for today, yeah, this discussion of scientific validity will, uh, towards the middle and towards the end, will uh, draw on some recent work I've been doing with uh, a postdoctoral fellow, uh, um, Dr. Morali, who uh, has helped uh, develop a theory of, um, of IRB uh, justification and legitimacy that I'll be drawing on uh, in today's talk and applying it to several cases. So, so today's session, I, I notice, um, I mean, we, this session is primarily geared towards, you know, Singaporean audience. You know, uh, researchers, IRB uh, secretariat and members um, working in Singapore. Uh, and for that reason, I'll be focusing, well, I'll be covering at least uh, in the first part of the talk, Singaporean uh, policies and standards. I think these are roughly in line with international standards as well. And I'll also reference some international guidance on this topic. Um, but some of the nitty gritty, you know, might be a, a little specific to Singapore, but we can discuss um, that as well. I'll also, at, some, at one point, be commenting actually on a particular procedural approach um, at uh, DSRB. I'm not speaking as a representative or anything of DSRB in Singapore, but I do have experience in DSRB that has informed uh, some, of, some of my thinking uh, in this area. Uh, and I hope uh, some of the things I have to say will therefore be informed by uh, practical uh, uh, realities of 
what IRBs are thinking, uh, what we're doing when we make determinations uh, about scientific validity in the protocols that we review. So we've got multiple hats, both as a scholar in research ethics, as well as you know sitting on an IRB. But I am not myself a biomedical researcher. So on the IRB that I sit on, I am what's called a lay person, a lay member. Um, yeah, even though I, I work on this professionally, I haven't I myself been involved in the content of biomedical research. So I have that kind of um, both insider and outsider view in this topic. And for those that are involved in biomedical research directly, I'm very happy to hear your perspectives on some of these issues um, during the Q&A discussion afterwards. Okay, um, so scientific validity um, is a concept uh, pretty well established in the research ethics literature. And I'm, I'm flashing right here a table from a very classic, a very important uh, piece in the research ethics literature uh, on um, uh, what makes uh, research, uh, clinical research ethical. Right? And this was by Ezekiel Emanuel, uh, Christine Grady, and Dave Wendler. Um, again, now it's yet yeah, almost uh, over two decades old, but it still remains, I think, a very significant and important contribution to the kind of core aspects of responsible conduct or re ethical conduct of research, I should say. Um, and I want to highlight in particular the first two items. This is the table that summarizes the different components of ethical research uh, that they put forward that's been widely utilized and circulated. And I want to focus on the first two for today's purposes uh, that look quite similar, right? The first is social or scientific value, and the second is scientific validity, okay? And there's some overlap between these, um, but today's focus is on the scientific validity item. So I need to first to the outset just to clarify and explain what the difference is between them, but also there is an important relationship between those two. Uh, there are two components among, of course, many components of what it takes for research to be ethical. So uh, scientific validity uh, concerns the use of accepted principles or methods, the methodology of the study uh, to generate valid and reliable results, all right? Um, so in some ways, scientific validity is a tech, the most technical um, uh, of the different requirements, uh, ethical requirements for research. And that's somewhat distinct from scientific value, uh, which as the name implied is more normative uh, value laden. And that concerns the potential benefits that may accrue from the knowledge gained, right? Um, and that, that knowledge gained, that is actually the raison d'etre of research itself. Research, of course, being defined in terms of, as we discussed in the first uh, session in this webinar series, um, the systematic investigation to generate generalizable knowledge, right? Uh, so scientific value relates to the, the reason, the impor importance of that knowledge. Uh, and in biomedical research, well, in, in, I actually have a background in philosophy. In philosophy, we think about knowledge as an end in itself, and, and I think it is, and that's important, and there's some, some legitimacy to that, but in biomedical ethics, um, typically uh, there, there's seen you know, a strong instrumental value. Sorry, uh, I got muted there for a second for some reason. Um, if, I, if there's an audio issue uh, or some issue with the slides, you can uh, let me know in the in a chat or, or flag it to me otherwise. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on that. Okay, so uh, scientific value, as I was saying, is the raison d'etre for, uh, for research. Uh, and in biomedicine, we think of that as instrumental. Uh, that is, it's uh, a means to the end of accruing some benefits through improved treatments, for example, or through better diagnostics, um, or even just better uh, understanding of course of diseases uh, that might help with, for example, um, um, prevention or public health management. Okay, but these are, even though these are conceptually distinct, they are very importantly related. And what I would suggest, and I think this is backed up in, in the literature, is that essentially uh, scientific the, the importance, the ethical importance of scientific validity is parasitic on the, val the scientific value. That is to say, the reason we care about scientific validity, the reason we think in particular it's an ethical issue, right? not just a purely scientific issue, the reason it's part of a research ethics review, right, is that um, scientific validity is essential to realizing scientific value. Right? So if you have a, a scientifically invalid uh, study, that is a study whose methodology is not adequate to generate uh, valuable, uh, to generate reliable knowledge, you're going to be unable to get any social benefits out of that knowledge, right? Um, so, you know, this can be because of poor methodology, which is one of the main things that, that you know, research ethics review is going to be focusing on. It could be because the data 
um, the data sources are unreliable or, or, uh, or corrupted in various ways. The data wasn't cleaned up properly when, when data analysis was done during secondary data research. It could be by um, the practice of research. If you have a research protocol that might look very good, but actually you're not following those protocols to the T. Um, certain tests are done or uh, are not done that should have been done or not done in, in accordance with the protocol and so forth. All of that can undermine the reliability of the, gener uh, of the knowledge generated. And these are all you know, aspects of scientific validity. And this can lead to two problems, right? So one is, uh, one, and two, I consider these to be ethical problems. Uh, one is an overly strong signal. This, what I mean by this is you can have a study that pur purports to have some positive finding. Maybe some particular treatment seems to have uh, a beneficial effect on, on patients uh, or, or a patient group. Right, but it turns out in reality it doesn't. Right, it's a, it's a false positive, so to speak, an overly strong signal, uh, and and that leads to implementation potentially of interventions that are not beneficial and potentially even harmful. Right, if there are risks to such interventions, uh, and that's uh, that's of course uh, against the public interest to have uh, such interventions be promulgated um, that are not as good or not uh, don't have the results that we want uh, for them. Then there's the negative, the flip side of that. Right? which is that because of your poor methodology, um, you uh, don't pick up on positive results. So you think that maybe some intervention, uh, maybe it's a drug, maybe it's a surgery, maybe it's a diagnostic tool. You think it doesn't work when it really does, right? Uh, and that means it's a sort of missed opportunity, right? So even though we've done this research, um, uh, we're going to fail to uptake something that really is valuable. So we've missed this uh, this chance to improve patient well-being, to improve uh, clinical practice, to improve maybe public health, uh, and that again is against the public interest, against the scientific value uh, of the uh, of the research, uh, and undermines um, the justification uh, for that research itself. So. This is a problem both because of the negative impact on the populace. That's a bigger issue for the overly strong uh, signal, right? So if you have an actual policy change or maybe a, sorry, a clinical practice change or uh, an impl implementation of something that doesn't work, right? That, that obviously has direct negative impact, um, bigger, bigger impact on when you have um, research that claim, uh, claims there is a result when there is not. There's also a concern, some have voiced about waste of resources. Bigger issue for publicly funded research, um, which in, in Singapore is, is a lot of the research being done. Uh, in, in this context, um, but not all of it. So I think there's a little bit of a stronger concern uh, when you have uh, to, to ensure scientific validity, when you have a public resource being spent, make sure that public resource uh, concerning you know, the funding for the research, et cetera, is being spent responsibly. There's also the issue of risk exposure. Um, certainly all interventional biomedical research and even a lot of uh, uh, non-interventional observational research, there's some risk involved to participants and indeed the whole research apparatus, uh, regulatory apparatus that's set up, much of it is geared towards uh, protection of participants from risk exposure and ensuring those risks that do occur in the research are within appropriate bounds or consented to and so forth. And if you have a scientifically invalid study or a study anyway that even has diminished scientific validity, um, then you might have risk exposure to participants without good justification. Right, so you've exposed individuals to maybe certain tests and procedures, maybe extra blood draws, maybe even biopsies, a lot of other things. Maybe maybe you do a CT scan. There's a bit of radiation exposure there, right? And we say, well, that's justifiable when we do a study because there's this potential, you know, scientific value that comes out of it. But if the study lacks scientific validity, then you don't get that value, and the risks lack ethical justification. So it's part of the risk benefit assessment um, that scientific value and therefore scientific validity is essential to ensure appropriate uh, that the benefits of the study outweigh the risks. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is a sort of, uh, well, there's a consent concern as well as a public perception concern. So there's a reasonable expectation both by participants when they agree to a study and in terms of the overall you know, society, what they expect of researchers, that research, uh, when it's conducted, um, uh, be beneficial to the public, to patients, to future patients, to, uh, in some way, a level of description, um, the broader uh, population beyond just the individuals participating in the study. Right, and so that expectation is part of the reason that individuals will agree in the first place. At least many times, uh, some will agree, agree for other reasons. But at least some participants will agree to uh, participate in research, based on the not just assumption but the impression they get from the consent process, from the description of the study, that this really is going to help. Right? This is going to improve outcomes in some way. If not for them, then for, again, future patients. And then again, uh, when, when population not only funds research, but even allows research to occur, you know, research um, in, in the research uh, settings, you can do things that maybe wouldn't normally be allowed in clinical settings. And population you know, accepts this and tolerates this on the uh, expectation that, again, there will be these public benefits accruing from that uh, research. <laughs> 
Okay, so and, and meeting that public expectation might be seen as part of the part of legit, legitimacy of the research enterprise, and failing to meet that expectation could undermine public trust, undermine what is sometimes called the social license uh, to conduct an activity. In this case, the social license to conduct research. Okay, um, but in that case, if we take these, as I think many many do, and it's well accepted in the literature, there to be some impetus, ethical impetus for scientific validity in research. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that um, that that research is any given study is scientifically valid? And how do we ensure that? What processes of oversight do we have? So now here's where I'm going to look a bit at the Singaporean context. Um, Human Biomedical Research Act, which covers um, uh, biomedical research in, research in Singapore that is not part of a, a clinical trial. Uh, actually, it's pretty silent on this issue. There's not a lot said about scientific validity, uh, scientific rigor, scientific merit, or other cognate terms in the law or the regulations. There's a few mentions here and there, um, and the tissue regulations, actually, uh, which is a little different from the human biomedical research regulations, uh, because in tissue with tissue banking, there's an, uh, you might not need uh, IRB review for disbursement of tissue. And there's an alternative to IRB review when, you, when a tissue bank disperses tissue for there to be a review of scientific merit. And that's an interesting thing that the idea is, okay, you could either go through IRB review or you could say, well, assess whether this use of this tissue when you're dispersing it uh, has you know, some scientific uh, validity to it. And I think the idea there gets back to the idea of, well, there's a resource and actually it's um, a scarce resource in some ways, uh, the tissue that's used in the tissue bank. And you wanna make sure that that resource is used responsibly uh, and that it isn't depleted, for example, uh, and it's used in accordance with the reasonable expectations of the individual from whom it was withdrawn. That is, that it would be used uh, for something um, valuable, not valuable in terms of the knowledge generated from its use. Yeah, so a little bit of mention there, but it's it's really prescribed. That only that all that that kind of scientific merit review only applies to again tissue banking uh, as a formal uh, as a formal rule under the regulations. And and what that means is that for IRBs, there's actually no regu regulatory requirement um, that they review. Uh, um, uh, scientific validity, and I'll come back to yeah what that what that means for in practice. Okay, but then the clinical trials regulations are substantially different. Um, clinical trials generally have stricter or tighter regulations in Singapore. Uh, that is, uh, trials investigating well, particularly pharmaceutical products as well as a few others. Um, and and because it's generally seen as you know a potentially higher risk profile and, and tighter regulations and um, uh, HSA. Um, the Health Sciences Authority is involved in approving or being notified anyway of clinical trials. Uh, and part of those regulatory requirements is compliance with uh, good clinical practice guidelines. Um, that is the ICHGCP uh, in particular. Uh, many of you will be familiar with that. I won't go into the details of the ICHGCP in this session, actually. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, actually. But um, you know, it is very detailed in terms of the standards. So you go from HBRA, which is pretty thin if you know, not, not much really there regulatory at all to the clinical trials where there's a bevy of uh, very particular requirements uh, for, uh, for study design and, and, and reporting, et cetera, um, that, is, uh, that researchers are expected to comply with. Um, and yeah, and, and HSA uh, under the law has the empowerment uh, to require amendments or even suspension of a trial, uh, not only due to patient safety, that's one grounds, but also scientific validity. So if there's some reason to think basically the study is not gonna be able to produce valuable results, HSA actually can, can either require a change or, or stop the study entirely. Um, and then related to that, uh, when amendments are uh, proposed um, or, or required even, or serious breaches are reported, um, that's not only for maybe safety reasons, but there is uh, one grounds for requiring an, an amendment or uh, reporting a serious breach is a substantial impact on the scientific value of a trial. Interesting there, it kind of goes between scientific value and scientific validity. Um, yeah, treats them somewhat interchangeably, but as I've seen, I think the reason it says scientific value in that portion is because um, that is the ultimate reason or grounds for the requirement um, it, under the clinical trials regulations to comply with these good clinical practice guidelines. And in that context, under the clinical trials regulations, IRBs have, do have a role in this regard in terms of a breach, a reporting of breaches, approval of amendments, as well as the initial study outline. And as we'll see, one of the one of the things that IRBs do do is look at the research protocol, uh, particularly for clinical trials. Uh, that not necessarily required for HBRA regulated studies, but uh, protocol submission is required for um, uh, for clinical trials. <clears throat> 
Um, and so beyond the, the law and the regulations, uh, there is um, guidance from the Bioethics Advisory Committee of Singapore. Um, and while this lacks, I guess, direct regulatory force, it is a parliamentary appointed committee and it has a substantial weight in that uh, in that regard um, of any, it's probably the most substantial, most weighty and substantial um, research ethics guidance document in Singapore, recently revised in 2021, to be consistent with uh, the changes in the H Human Biomedical Research Act. Uh, and the section I'll just highlight here um, is that it does say explicitly in, uh, ensuring research proposals, uh, IRB's remit includes ensuring that research proposals have been scientifically evaluated and have scientific merit as would be unethical to subject participants to any risk of uh, or research that is so poorly designed that it could not yield generalizable knowledge. So again, getting to this idea that I highlighted earlier, uh, scientific value uh, as the reason why we care about and do review scientific validity uh, during ethics oversight. But I just wanna highlight this other little addendum here. The IRB is not expected to undertake such scientific review itself, which is an interesting little caveat um, and so it, it, it suggests that there is this ethical importance, but maybe IRBs aren't the best place to do the ethical review themselves. And I'll return to this, this concern in a little bit and think about how this is implemented in practice and what that means. But just to highlight, this is not again a uniquely Singaporean concern. This is well accepted principle in international literature. So those of you that are familiar with the history of research ethics, one of the um, earlier uh, declarations and codes um, of research ethics was the Nuremberg Code, which drew out of uh, drew out, uh, come out, came out of uh, World War II and the Nazi atrocities not, and, and grossly unethical experiments. And one one component of this Nuremberg Code that um, I think set the stage for uh, for inclusion of scientific validity in pretty much all guidance documents after that point. So the experiment should be uh, such as to yield fruitful results for the good of society, unprocurable by other methods or means of study, and not random or unnecessary in nature. And again, I think this gets to the risk proportionality justification of, um, of, research, uh, of research ethics review of scientific validity. A declaration of Helsinki, um, which is primarily geared towards physicians uh, and physicians participating in clinical trials, um, but nevertheless has been uh, widely used uh, in, in clinical research uh, standard setting uh, beyond just uh, uh, advising clinicians, says that me medical research involving human subjects must conform to accepted scientific principles um, uh, based on thorough knowledge of the literature, other relevant sources of information, uh, et cetera. And finally, we have the SIOMS guidelines, um, which is uh, more broad-based than the Declaration of Helsinki. Uh, and those say that, uh, and that has a whole section. The first, actually the very first um, uh, uh, chapter or section of the SIOMS guidelines uh, do say that, um, do focus on scientific validity and value. And it's, it's actually uh, more extensive than either the Nuremberg or, and Declaration of Helsinki. There's some detailed guidance there. Uh, and they say the research sponsors and ethics committees, authorities, so all those parties, it's interesting, right? So all parties involved have this responsibility to ensure the proposed studies are scientifically sound, built on adequate prior knowledge base and likely to generate valuable information. So again, linking together the scientific validity and the scientific value um, uh, components there. Yeah, so and again, just to repeat, um, uh, the, while, the, while the kind of whose responsibility is a little ambiguous in the first two bullets, SIAMS takes it as kind of all parties' responsibility, a shared responsibility, if you will. But that still leaves a question of how particular parties should assess this. And, and I'll focus actually today um, for the rest of the discussion on, on IRB's roles, institutional review board's roles in this regard. And for those of you that are kind of parts of IRBs, I think this will still be of interest because it'll help understand you know, why IRBs are, are looking at this. Some of you might be skeptical of that um, and, and how IRBs, maybe well, in my view, should, and, and maybe we can all talk about more in practice how they do look at uh, these issues. So again, my experience is with, is with DSRB in Singapore, DSRB being one of the two biggest IRBs uh, in Singapore. I'm, a, I'm just part of one subdomain of that. Um, but just to, and if this is public information, um, you can see it on their website. Uh, but there is in the application process for DSRB, when, when researchers submit a protocol to DSRB for review, there's this whole section, I think it's section F, uh, on research methodology, right? So it's definitely, so even though there's, you recall, there was that well, IRBs aren't expected to undertake scientific review itself. Maybe they could, you know, outsource it to some third party. That's been a suggestion in the literature somewhere. No, DSRB, we, we get these materials. Um, so we get uh, details about the study aim, okay. But then we have whole sections on the design. And, and you know, it can be uh, maybe not, not necessarily a whole protocol if it's not a clinical trial, but we want details about, you know, what's being done, the procedures, why they're being done, 
how they relate to the, um, the outcome measures and so forth. We do have a separate item on the sample size and power calculations. I'll, I'll return to that, that particular item later. I think it's really interesting that we have, we, we dedicate a whole subsection to that item. That means we kind of pay a little more attention to it than maybe some other aspects of design. Um, inclusion exclusion criteria, scientific, uh, scientifically important, not just for the purpose of protecting certain participants, but also ensuring the people that are included are the right population um, for what you're trying to achieve with your end. Um, we also include, we require the inclusion of the, of the curriculum vitae of the PI and the study team. And that's to make sure they're appropriately qualified. Again, not just a matter of patient uh, participant safety, but also to make sure that they really can, you know, do a study that, that will produce um, good results. Uh, in addition, as mentioned, um, for clinical trials, the full protocol itself uh, must be uh, appended. And indeed, you also have things like the investigators for sure. Uh, they might also include uh, certain uh, methodological items in there uh, concerning delivery of medicines. But uh, as I think many of you might have experienced, there are some challenges with IRB review of scientific validity. I mean, these are challenges that I've, I've experienced um, in my time and on, on, on the IRB as a, as a layperson, as someone that you know, I have ethics training, but maybe not scientific training. And, and that, that kind of puts me in an interesting position. So you might think, well, look, you know, someone like me reviewing scientific validity, but I, I, I might lack expertise. Um, uh, to do this, uh, and that you know, and you know, I'm expected to to look at this, but you know, maybe I just uh, um, have to um, uh, turn to my uh, scientific colleagues on the IRB to make judgments in that area. And indeed, we do have you know multiple reviewers, <clears throat> excuse me, per full board protocol. Uh, so there always is going to be a scientific member looking at the methodology. But there's a question of well, you know, the layperson is looking at it too, and could they make you know? Could I make some bad judgments about, about methodological issues? Maybe. Um, there's also a uh, concern that sometimes scientific validity can be in tension with participant protection. Right? I mentioned we're concerned about protecting participants from risks, but sometimes uh, the best way to get you know, valuable uh, generalizable knowledge is to expose certain groups to more risk than they otherwise would. So, and, and, and so for example, you might be looking to recruit certain vulnerable populations. Um, one thing is you know, uh, recruitment of children, for example, in research. And that exposes them to risk, and they're not often able. Often they're not able to consent for themselves, or their autonomy is limited in various ways. Uh, and you know that that's a limitation. And so we there's this rule, right? You only really recruit children if it's necessary to achieve your results. Um, but that necessity criterion doesn't apply to other other groups, and it might actually be setting back to some extent um, the ability to recruit quickly, um, the ability to recruit across a, a wide variety of conditions, et cetera, um, to have this general default against including children unless it's really essential, right? So there might be a tension, that is to say, and I'll return to that uh, in a little bit of discussion later. Um, in addition, uh, there's concerns that scientific review might be redundant. This gets to back to the you know, BAC that says maybe the IRB itself doesn't need to do the review because other people have. You have grant applications, right? Where you're proposing your methodology, and, including the scientific value of the research you're doing uh, and the way you're going to achieve it. And that's been you know, peer reviewed typically. Um, you have the institutional processes themselves, institutional expectations. Um, you, have, uh, some, you might have some scientific review committees at some institutions. We have the ICH GCP inspections that's you know, handled separately from IRBs. You also have peer review uh, at the later stages, right? So you have um, uh, during publication processes when knowledge is disseminated, right? There's a gatekeeping system. Uh, and that gatekeeping system, well, there's flaws in it. But nevertheless, um, there's ways to make sure that kind of um, poorly designed studies uh, don't get as much visibility and attention, maybe don't even get published at all uh, to minimize the risk of, I guess, that first risk of, of overly strong signals or something. Okay, so those are challenges. I don't want to say these challenges are, you know, though sufficient to totally remove the concern of um, uh, other sorry, the reasons for uh, we uh, reviewing uh, scientific validity, but there are there are caveats here that maybe should attenuate. Uh, how strongly the IRB should be taking a line on these areas. And this is where I want to bring in the work that I've done with Dr. Uh, Anantharam Morali Duran, or Morali. I don't know if he's in this session. But we wrote a paper, and we're doing some follow a follow-up paper that's going to be more practical. This is a theoretical paper, but uh, we're working now on a, on a practical paper of more direct use to IRBs about how IRBs need to be publicly justifiable. And what we mean by that is these, these decisions, they restrict researchers. The they, IRB is actually their approval is needed for a study to go forward. So the IRB says, no, a study won't happen, right? Um, and that, that, that is, um, uh, you can say coercive, that is a restriction. That's a, a force, a power that the IRB has. And when you have such a power, especially when an ethical judgment is being made, and as I was arguing, these scientific validity issues are fundamentally ethical issues, uh, you need to be able to justify that to the researchers, to the public. 
And publicly justifiable, what publicly justifiable means that um, if you're going to restrict, if you're going to say researchers to re a researcher, you can't do this, or you must do that, right? Um, you have to avoid opposing your, your will, your kind of arbitrary um, perspective on them. And the way we cash that out is you can't have reasonable disagreement. So if there's reasonable disagreement. It could be reasonable to do the study this way. It could be reasonable to do the study that way. And you know, there's you know, different people in the literature. They're, 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 they're using similar evidence and they come to different conclusions, but they're all acting in good faith and none of them are kind of really you know, uh, completely beyond the pale. Um, that's, that, that reasonable disagreement should be tolerated. And IRBs, is what we argue in this paper, uh, should um, avoid um, requiring researchers to change protocol or, to, or change a study if there's reasonable disagreement over whether or not a given aspect of the study is ethically acceptable. And that principle extends to scientific methodology because that methodology is itself subject. The appropriateness of methodology is subject to reasonable disagreement. So there's a lot of literature, a lot of academic debate over things like necessity of placebo groups, alternative study designs, even after COVID-19 especially, there's a lot of um, uh, exploration of alternatives to the standard gold standard of RCTs, um, issues of sample size uh, cal uh, calculation, I'll return to that again, um, is, is, uh, is disputed. Um, and so in these kind of circumstances, the idea is from this, uh, from this theory that there's some deferral towards researchers that's warranted, okay? That IRBs uh, should to some extent uh, defer to researchers. Some other grounds for why deferral towards researchers when there's reasonable reasonable disagreement might be, might be um, um, relevant. Again, this epistemic asymmetry. So uh, one thing about, you know, public justification is it, really, it assumes reasonable, reasonable disagreement assumes kind of people are in the same epistemic position. But actually, when you have a researcher, they are much better versed on the grounding for a study, the, the reasons any given test is done, et cetera, than IRB members, especially someone like me, but even the scientific members, right? The epistemic asymmetry means researchers are probably in a better position to know whether or not a given uh, methodology is scientifically appropriate than IRB members. Uh, in addition, so there's an uninterest alignment. Now, with the issue of protection of participants, there's a real conflict of interest there. Researchers want to researchers want to, you know, generate a good study, and that might sometimes lead to exposing participants to excess risk. And that, that's a trade-off, and that's why we maybe don't necessarily want researchers to make all the decisions concerning uh, subject protection. We need this independent body. But with scientific validity, it's different. Researchers institutionally have very strong incentives to have robust methodology. Right? Because we have, again, this peer review system. We have uh, a system of reward that is meant to, uh, ideally anyway, um, reward more rigorous, more, val more scientifically valid research. And so that, that, that means there's less, maybe less of a concern that researchers uh, have this conflict of interest that could undermine um, the ethical concern, in this case, of generating valuable scientific knowledge. Finally, again, this issue of redundancy, even though I think it's not fully redundant and there are gaps, um, uh, there are these other sources of scientific review um, that might be able to, uh, to be ex an extra safety net, might make us less concerned um, about scientific methodological review than other areas. So the kind of principle um, that I'm proposing here, this is, this is unlike the other stuff, this is not you know, a, a rule that DSRB endorses, this is just my view, just to be clear, um, but this is, this is a, a, a view that I think um, uh, would be helping to um, determine how we should adjudicate some of these uh, edge cases in scientific methodological review. So it is that uh, when assessing scientific validity, IRBs should only be required require an amendment or other you know other requirement other required change uh, to a study when the current methodolo methodology or design is patently unreasonable. Similarly, for rejection, right, only should reject a study when the design is not only unreasonable but it's basically it's infeasible. They're going to get to a, a feasible design. Um, so that's that's basically a high bar. Uh, for um, reverting and amend and requiring amendments or changes to methodology, or furthermore, rejecting a study on the basis of uh, poor design. So it's still compatible, to be clear, with clarificatory questions. And often with IRB review, we have these two rounds. Initially, we kind of do a review, and we have lots of questions. We ask the PI, okay, what about this? Can you change this? What about that? And so it's still compatible at that stage of um, you know of, of, of clarifying why did you pick this particular design? What's what, what's your sample size calculation, and so forth. Um, so that, that that's a little bit of an easier thing to ask, although there is time, cost in terms of these requests. I note that when we do this um, this turnaround, the biggest time delay, one of the biggest time delays, is not actually the IRB's time to review, but the time for researchers to incorporate the uh, questions and respond to them. So there is some time cost. We shouldn't be too blasé about uh, about just asking questions on the IRB, but it's still less uh, it's still less um, forceful than saying you must change this in this way. <laughs> 
It also, I think, um, minimizes the degree of scientific review. So going back to the BAC principle that, you know, the IRB uh, doesn't necessarily have to do the full scientific review itself. Um, and it also is in line with the implicit regulatory remit, especially um, under the HBRA, but even under clinical trials, which seems to vest HSA with more powers concerning scientific uh, validity uh, standards. Um, it, it, it uh, I think is appropriate, uh, the consonant with the seeming intent behind those laws, whereas you know things like informed consent, very strict, clear you know requirements under the law. The fact that the law is more silent in this area, I think, is suggestive that a principle of deferral might be more appropriate. And but still, just to be clear, uh, this is not the removal of scientific validity review. Uh, I'm not suggesting we, we no longer pay attention to scientific validity at IRBs. There's still the safety net, essentially, right? When there's really egregious issues, really serious issues, um, you know, you, you want to have there. But when, when the other kind of checks aren't there, maybe you know, there's, there's you know, maybe it's a PI self-funded grant, or I don't know. There there hasn't been the institutions uh, kind of dropped the ball. Having the IRB there to pick up these serious issues, I think, is is relevant and essential for uh, ensuring studies uh, are proportionate. The risks are proportionate and justifiable use of resources. Okay, so here's some uh, some example applications of this of this principle, a little bit abstract. So I'll apply it to some sort of uh, things I've encountered on in my time as during IRB review. Uh, so I'll return to this issue of sample size calculation. Um, and you know, okay, I'm a lay person. I, I usually can't evaluate, you know, the actual calculation. I, I defer, you know, when you, have, when you have the, you know, the, the power calculations, I, I, I kind of defer to my scientific colleagues in that. But sometimes I see the absence of a calculation at all, right? And I'll say things. Sometimes it'll be so. Well, this is a pilot study or an exploratory study, so no sample size calculation is necessary, right? Because the idea is not that we're going to be, you know, um, this is going to be used as informing practice. This is just going to be informing whether or not we're going to conduct some study in the future. Right, and we, we do this preliminary study. We get some basic results, and then we build up to maybe a, a further phase two type trial or something. Um, yeah, and, and therefore we're not going to give a sample size because we're not. Yeah, you know, there's, no, there's no particular power calculation needed for that. Okay, I, I can kind of see that, but the problem there is you still have a recruitment target. We're recruiting X number of people. So, so how does that? Where does that number come from? Is it random? You know, uh, and you know, even exploratory studies, there's still risks to participants. Okay, you still have this over recruitment uh, risk that you just don't need to recruit. 30 people, 20 would do, but you expose 10 extra people to extra blood draws, biopsies, whatever, what have you, some, some potentially uh, risky procedures, or you expose them if it's experimental treatment, uh, potentially to something prematurely, um, uh, more, more people than you should have. Or conversely, too few, uh, then you might say that, that actually it was exploratory and a nice pilot, but maybe that data is insufficient to actually be a, a good grounds for that future study. Uh, and maybe it would have, wouldn't have made a difference um, uh, whether or not you did the exploratory study if you have too few participants to say anything useful about whether a future study is feasible. So without any sample size, um, you know, explanation for the sample size, it's, it, there's, there's, no, there's no way to actually assess whether it's too few or too many. So, so you know, usually ask for some explanation for why this number is picked, if not an actual formulaic calculation, then some justification for those numbers. And you know this might seem you know a little pedantic, but I have seen in the past when I've queried at least once or twice when I've queried this. Sometimes they come back with a good justification. I have seen um, at least once or twice researchers change their uh, target group size based on this type of query because when they actually go back and try to justify, they realize the best number is different from what they had proposed. So that so there in that case, that kind of gave me confidence. It is okay to query this because researchers saw it as reasonable to go back and actually um, actually come up with some some concrete explanation for the numbers that they pick. Um, another uh, area is an area, I'll call it synthetic control arm, though I think the argument applies to general kind of issues of uh, study designs that fall short of RCTs. But um, instead of a placebo arm, synthetic control arm is when you have a single arm study, essentially, and the control is just modeled based on, you know, uh, real world data, maybe from uh, electronic health records, administrative data, other things, you know, kind of model how patients in this condition would respond in this trajectory in this time. Um, and, and instead of having a control group that's given a placebo, you compare your single arm interventional results to that kind of synthetic control arm, right, where no one is actually enrolled. And that's argued to have cost savings, improved efficiency. It actually also potentially reduces risks because there's, few, there's fewer individuals that are exposed to potentially unnecessary tests and procedures. Um, but it's evidentially inferior to the randomized control trial. RCT remains the gold standard of evidence. Um, in, in biomedicine. Uh, and with this synthetic control, there's risks of bias in the data set that you're drawing from. These are not direct comparators. You try to model a similar circumstance, but you, know, you won't be able to control for everything. And so different confounders can come in and, and you won't be as confident. And the, and the international community won't be as confident in your results um, with that. So I'd ask, um, couldn't, if an IRB sees a single arm study, con synthetic control arm, 
could it push back and say, oh, uh, we're worried this isn't going to be scientifically valid, uh, and we want you to to include a control arm, right? Is is that a, a legitimate thing for IRBs to do? Well, um, it's true that RCT uh, going uh, uh, failing to abide by an RCT model does go below sort of the gold standard, but that doesn't mean it has no scientific value. You know, these these single arm studies do generate knowledge that is valuable, even if it's not you know optimal. Um, it's still knowledge that can inform practice. Indeed, there is this growing literature on particularly synthetic control arms. Um, it's not you know quack science. It's not just an aberrant view that a, that a, a, a few um, uh, snake oil salesmen are are pushing. It's something that has um, has substantial um, uh, backing behind it, even if it's not completely widely uh, accepted. And um, it also has some advantages, I think, over more traditional kind of just single arm uh, trials, uh, because there is an attempt to try to model, again, this control group in a more rigorous way than has been done historically. Furthermore, uh, there is precedent, substantial precedent for regulatory approval based purely on even traditional single arm trials, not even with you know, synthetic control arms, but just single arm trials. Many examples could be given. I'll just highlight one. Recently, I was just, you know, you, you, can, you can search for many others, but just one in Singapore. Uh, Yescarta, which is a CAR T cell therapy uh, for um, uh, for lymphoma, right? Uh, and this is a special category. There's only there's only a few of these types of, of cell therapies approved in Singapore. Um, they're very expensive. Uh, that's a whole separate set of issues. Whether IRB should be considering that, um, but anyway, uh, leave that for a different day. Um, but um, uh, it's uh, you know it was uh, it was demonstrated in a single arm study and looked like from the reading I read from the HSA documentation. Simple size of 111 people, so not huge, uh, and no no control group. It was just I think it was just looking comparing it to you know, general clinical outcomes, um, and and that was given given approval. There's still going to be requirements for um, for uh, for um, results from kind of real world evidence of, of Yascarta to be uh, published. Uh, in addition, I think there is um, a larger scale um, RCT going on for Yascarta, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there is further evidence being gathered. Right, it's not the end of it. But nevertheless, um, you know, this study, this 111 person study did have direct impact on practice, right? So it is clear that you can, um, if it won't be the, oh, scientific community and regulators will say, oh, single arm study, rubbish, toss it. No, it, you can have in some contexts, certain studies, single arm studies can inform uh, uh, practice and approval. Uh, so the upshot uh, I would suggest is that, well, even IRB members and I, I myself actually count myself in this category, am a bit suspicious of the validity of synthetic models. And I, I am actually concerned about things like Yaskarta's, you know, uh, evidentiary basis, given the costs especially. Um, but, you know, there's reasonable disagreement in this literature. Okay, that's the key thing, right? So this is not, you know, um, a, a, a clear shot, cut and dry thing where, okay, you have no, you know, there's no evidence. Like with the sample size calculation, you have no sample size calculation or no evidence. There's nothing to base it off of. That's easy. But here, there's reasonable disagreement over the appropriateness of this methodology. Um, uh, and so I, I think that, and especially given some regulatory acceptance of single arm trials, um, that shows not just researchers, but also regulatory authorities that sometimes take these this evidence base as sufficient for changing practice. Um, IRBs are probably not well placed to insist on uh, such radical changes as including control arms, um, unless there's some very specific scenario um, where, uh, where where it's absolutely necessary. In general, um, uh, IRBs should should be differential in this in this context. I would suggest. Um, a third kind of category or, or genre uh, will be in the validity and welfare trade-off. This is something I alluded to earlier uh, because scientific validity does relate to risk benefit assessment. And so here's just an example um, I saw from uh, a case study in the literature. Uh, so maybe if, this gets away from kind of you know, pure biomedical research, more from social behavioral. But anyway, if you're looking at um, bereavement support, right, trying to better understand when families lose a loved one and trying to better um, cater to their needs, their psychological needs, their, their mental well-being needs, you might want to gather some data uh, through interviews and questionnaires of such individuals to understand what they're going through and then maybe use that as the basis for, uh, for certain interventions later on. And for this, you might think about timing of when to approach bereaved family members. You could approach them uh, immediately after the event, and that might be maximizing scientific validity, uh, because that's when they're, you know, that's when they're in the throes of their grief, and that's when, they, if there were an intervention, that's when you might intervene at that point or very close to that, uh, and you might get the most reliable uh, information on how, they're, how the how the bereavement is immediately affecting them. An alternative, but the, but the concern there would be that that's also the time when they're most likely to be harmed by the questionnaire, because it might be seen as intrusive, exacerbate their anxiety, and so forth. So instead, you might want to want to delay these questionnaires, these interviews, maybe to some longer period of time afterwards when they had time to process it. So the interviews or questionnaires are less likely to cause psychological distress to them. 
but that also might lower the quality of the results as far as that time lapse might also mean they have less insight into um, into into the um, into the their state of mind immediately afterwards, right? So it might be um, their state of mind has improved over time, but they were still distressed at the time. Um, their answers might have been very different in those two time periods. And if your intervention is aimed at you know immediately after the bereavement or very soon after the bereavement, waiting too long might impact the scientific validity. So there's a trade-off between those two values, you know, protecting participants from uh, psychological distress and maximizing the scientific validity of the study. Okay, um, so these value trade-offs typically involve substantial disagreement or divergence of opinion, right? So especially in the present case, when you have these, what seem like incommensurate values, the values of different kinds, it's not like trading trade off risk of death of one intervention versus risk of death of another. It's you have one thing, scientific value, which is, you know, knowledge accrued to the general population, which is really indirect um, benefits to future patients, maybe, or future families, um, versus um, the value, uh, versus, sorry, versus the disvalue of um, the distress caused by the intervention, right? And these are in some ways apples and oranges. And that, that's really difficult to do that, that weighing up. You could say we're gonna rely on the informed consent process. These, in this particular example, right? That you would have consent for the uh, questionnaires um, or the interviews. Um, but, and if, if some participants are just in a state, they, 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 they are gonna be too upset by discussing this, you know, they might, um, might just say no. But uh, the problem with that, one problem with that, among others, participants are unlikely to fully appreciate the scientific value. You can include it in the consent form, but they're not likely to have a full appreciation of what the likelihood of this is to translate to actual, say, improvement of care in the future. Um, yeah, so it's not clear they can make they can fully make that that uh, that assessment on their own. That's one of the reasons we have IRBs do the risk benefit assessment. We don't just rely on consent processes. Um, okay, so in that case, using the framework that I put forward, could we say one option or the other is unreasonable? Right, that, that was the bar that I said. If a researcher proposes one or the other, could the IRB say, no, 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 this is unreasonable? Uh, and I, I would say, no, I don't think that, that the IRB could actually say that. Uh, as long as there's adequate protections in the case, um, this would be indicated in terms of providing potential counseling, having a counselor on hand is good standard of practice, you know, to refer if a patient breaks down during an interview or a questionnaire, you know, you can put those protections in place. Uh, actually, in, in either version, you would probably have those protections and that helps minimize the risks. Um, and it seems either either approach would be potentially reasonable. People might reasonably disagree. So in that case, again, you would defer, I would suggest deferring to the researcher in this uh, scenario. Um, if it, there were queries, it might be just in terms of um, altering design to ensure or minimize the risks related to that distress. Uh, it could include changing the wording of the questions or it could include, again, uh, counseling availability, but it wouldn't mean um, necessarily uh, uh, requiring an adjustment to the methodology um, of, the, um, of the timing at least. It would be deferral to researchers in that case. Okay, so those are just some suggestive applications. Um, I have, okay, I'm running actually a bit over time. Uh, so I'll very quickly just highlight uh, a further thing of, uh, a further point of consideration that, that has been raised by uh, actually uh, Julian Cevalescu, a pre uh, speaker at the previous session, but he's raised it in a different context, um, which is about data access committees. And these are bodies entrusted to review access to data sets, usually for research purposes. Uh, these are not IRBs, they're different. So it's a different set of considerations. Um, uh, and they usually look at things like identity verification, purpose limitation, uh, data protection, uh, services. Uh, but there's a further question of whether DAX should be reviewing, uh, in the course of reviewing requests for access, should review scientific validity, or should that not be within their remit? And indeed, there's some guidance in this area, uh, not out of Singapore. This is out of um, uh, GA4GH, that's Global, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. They have a very nice um, uh, uh, data access committee guidance, and they talk about things DAC should be doing, looking at user IDs, you know, looking at minimal risk standards, data protection. Those are essential for DACs, right? All DACs should be doing these things. Then they talk about desired uh, criteria for assessment of, of a DAC. And they say, well, maybe, and this is so it's discretionary, maybe DACs should look at, among other things, highlight number two, how will the participants' uh, data um, uh, subjects' data be used to investigate the research question? Right? And that gets to this kind of scientific methodology uh, of data use issue. Um, so, okay, it's a bit, uh, the, the, the GA4JH is a bit on the fence on this. Um, going back to the reasons why, why we thought this is valuable. Well, the key thing here to note is 
the biggest reason, the third reason about risk really doesn't apply very well in this context. So data, data, uh, data distribution usually is of minimal risk, if of any risk at all, especially if it's de-identified, almost no risk. But even, even identifiable data, there's very good data protections. And as far as I'm aware, uh, for all the um, in Singapore during um, PD Personal Data Protection Commission's enforcement actions, uh, research data uh, promulgation has not been the source of any major breach um, that I'm aware of to date. So yeah, so it seems like it's very low risk. So it would be, so the, the main ethical justification, the, the risk proportionality issue doesn't really apply, but the other three do, right? The negative impact on population from knowledge that is you know, incorrect, uh, the waste of resources, and especially if it's a publicly, um, a DAC that's kind of publicly run or, or uh, run by a public entity, as well as again, the public trust issue, public expectations, that when the DAC disperses data, it's doing so for scientifically valuable products, uh, projects. Um, and then there's also this concern about redundancy um, because you know IRBs uh, also might be reviewing the very same protocols. Though to be clear, careful here because uh, with data research, IRBs will often be doing so in an expedited manner, so in a more superficial manner. And indeed for de-identified data, they may not review the studies at all because the regulatory requirements for review only apply to identifiable data research, not an anonymized data research. So there might for some of these disbursements be no IRB review at all. So redundancy possible, but not entirely clear. So going back to the proportionality of risk review, um, given the lower risk profile, I probably don't want to expect the same degree of scrutiny. So maybe you don't want that whole methodology section like you have with the DSRB applications. Um, and you want, might want to especially retain and emphasize this differential approach. So even if you're skeptical, maybe in the IRB case, um, especially here in the DAC case, if it's going to be done uh, a scientific validity to review, you might want to do this deferential review. That is to say, you're only really pushing back uh, against a proposal that has you know, patently unreasonable methodologies. You know, uh, Again, Maybe, the, maybe, if you want, maybe not quite the realm of quack science, but, but methodologies that just don't make sense, get, asking for data that doesn't seem pertinent to the question being asked. Sometimes data researchers ask for you know, a smorgasbord for thousands of data points if you have a big data set, I don't know. Uh, and you know, it doesn't make sense you need that. Maybe you say, well, okay, do you really need a thousand? Justify why you need this, that, and the other thing. Um, uh, and some pushback there, but a reasonable response why they need all this data um, uh, could be accepted. Okay, uh, so just to, to wrap up uh, the talk, uh, I've, su I've suggested in line with international consensus uh, that scientific validity uh, is indeed a component of ethical research and IRBs are, um, I think it is appropriate for IRBs to, uh, to make that review. And indeed IRBs in Singapore typically do undertake some form of uh, assessment of certain aspects of scientific validity. Uh, but the area where you know I, I'm putting forward my own suggestions here is that I think in these cases, nevertheless, um, there should be a deferentialism, right? There should be substantial defer deferral to the researcher concerning appropriate methodology. And it's really when you know either there's no reason given or no adequate reason given at all for a given design, um, or there's something patently uh, mistaken that that you know the IRB should substantially push back. Um, I've also suggested that these principles of scientific validity might apply to things other than other forms of review, such as DAC review, um, though maybe in a more limited form. Okay, uh, so that's it for my presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, we can now open it up for questions, uh, discussion, and, uh, and input. You can again use, you can either type your questions in the chat to everybody, or you can raise your hand and we can discuss that way. Okay, uh, so first, uh, Marcus, you, you think you're first out of the gate, so you wanna uh, raise your, your question? Well, thanks for the presentation, and thanks also for making available this uh, this webinar series on YouTube, which is great if if, if you miss a session. Um, I have a question about um, so not about scientific validity, but about this very related concept, scientific value and social value, right? So you put forward this requirement for scientific validity, which is that the IRB should push back or make amendment requirements only um, if uh, the current methodology is patently unreasonable. This is for scientific validity. Um, but suppose a study is scientifically valid, but it would you would actually generate more benefits, significantly more benefits, scientific as well as social, um, if the methodology were to, were to be changed. Um, so do you think the IRB should, in those cases, push back on it? So again, it is scientifically valid. It answers the research question at hand, but there is a, perhaps a related research question. And if the protocol were slightly modified, um, should the IRB push back on that and, and ask for that modification? Yeah, so that's an interesting idea. So one one thing is that there's a threshold requirement. You, you know, the protocol needs to meet a certain threshold of scientific validity and scientific value to be approved uh, acceptable. That's the sort of the CIOMS line. They might ask, okay, but the IRB could go further and could maximize scientific value by saying, why don't you also, you know, um, uh, do this sort of test or or have that sort of procedure that will maximize the value of your study. Um, so in this case, I would still I would be reluctant for an IRB to insist 
that methodology be changed for this maximization purpose? Um, because uh, but, but the question, but the better approach would be to ask the question. So you might feel a query to the researcher, why uh, is there, here's a possibility, consider this, why wouldn't you? Uh, and then the researcher might come back and say, well, we just don't have the resources to do so, for example. That's probably oftentimes why this particular you know, test isn't done. And then there's this research que resource question. Well, you know, is it really worth the research researcher's time and effort to do this extra test or this extra procedure um, to get this, you know, more valid, more robust result? And that again, I think is just a reason. Firstly, the IRB is not in a position at all to make that evaluation for the researcher whether or not it's worth the researcher's time and money and effort. Um, and second of all, even if they were somehow aware of the budget and time, it's again reasonable disagreement. And, and the researcher, I think, has a, a strong claim in that regard. So in that case, yeah, I think it's something that could be seen as within the remit of the IRB to query, but I wouldn't want, I wouldn't, I would think it'd be inappropriate for the IRB to insist on a change purely for social value maximization. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, uh, Joel uh, is asking, uh, would there be a scenario where scientific validity or value um, wouldn't be an issue in the IRB could still approve it. Okay, there's an example here. Uh, SSB, uh, social behavioral research uh, by a student PI, like, like a survey, only risk is waste of the time. And upside would be it's a learning process. And actually at NUS, we have these departmental research ethics committees, um, which you know, maybe they have a different set of standards. They, they see things like you know social behavioral student uh, research. Um, I think that's a fair point when you, if you're thinking about proportionate review, Right. When risks are low or minimal, you apply less scrutiny. That makes perfect sense to me. So when you have an expedited review process or an exempted review process, and with you know this kind of survey, that would probably be appropriate anyway. Um, yeah, you might think um, you, you don't need to uh, ask for as much information on scientific methodology. Uh, you might, you know, um, yeah. Uh, there's a further point. Yeah. So, so I think that it's fair enough to to uh, 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 to yeah have uh, risk uh, risk relative scrutiny of review. Um, there's a further kind of question here, though, I guess, implicit in this, or maybe ex ex explicit, which is you know, it, it, for this kind of student-led research, there's not really s the scientific value per se, because the results are being used maybe in a term paper, you know, not be published. Um, it's just being done for pedagogical purposes, right? And so there is, it's not really scientifically valuable at all. So maybe there's no scientific value to the study because you know, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to be changing practice because of it. It's just a pedagogical exercise. And that's interesting. That is a very different standard. I, I guess um, I was applying a scientific value in the context of biomedical research where the aim is generalizable knowledge. And I'm not certain actually with this pedagogical, or this pedagogical work, the aim really is generalizable knowledge. So I'm not certain that really would qualify by, for example, the regulatory definition of research. I think it's good to apply you know, similar ethics standards. Um, you, know, you want to have the survey be justifiable. You want to have good methodology just as a matter of pedagogy. Um, but you're, we were no longer necessarily going to need to apply the same standards. I think that the pedagogical approach, you know, the so the departmental ethics uh, uh, ethics research, uh, departmental um, ethics research committee. Sorry, I can't remember what it stands for. That Dirk um, would be looking more at that kind of internal pedagogical purpose, and that I think is a different set of standards. So yeah, I, I think uh, I think that. That's perfectly appropriate to apply, maybe even if not differentialism, though, uh, in that case, uh, there's not a much of a problem with saying we're going to tell the student you must do it this way in that case, because you're not preventing the, re the student from doing something they have sort of a background right to do. You're kind of acting as a teacher in that regard. So I think the standards are actually very different the more I think about it for these student projects. Um, yeah, so so I, I, I have to think about that more, but I think maybe some of the principles I put forward wouldn't apply to purely pedagogical research for pedagogical purposes. But yeah, interesting to think about. Okay, um, another question uh, from uh, Tracy. Uh, DAC, oh, this is about the, uh, the uh, Data Access Committee review, uh, uh, might be uh, concerning about uh, consent. So some DACs or guidelines require that a study be in the public interest. In that case, would scientific validity become more pertinent? That's an interesting point. Um, yeah, and this is an area where actually I'm, I'm involved with some research uh, with some colleagues here related to the trust platform in Singapore. Uh, maybe some of you are also involved in that as well. Um, and yeah, this is a question, right? Uh, and Singapore uh, uh, trust platform, which is used for uh, dispersing genomic data, does have a public interest requirement. Um, but okay, I, I said before, there's a connection. Scientific validity is predicated on scientific value. So if you're assessing scientific validity, um, that would that assumes that there's some scientific value you're realizing. So, so it assumes the two go together. But it's not the opposite direction. And what I mean by that is you could evaluate public interest right, of a study without any attention 
to scientific validity. You could just say, what is the end of this study, right? What, what, what is the, the purpose? What is it trying to gain? And how would that improve societal outcomes, right? If, if, if this study achieved its aims, okay? Um, and that question could be answered without any, any uh, uh, examination of the methodology at all. So, so I think it's not, if you're talking about public interest, you, it's not essential that you look at um, uh, uh, the methodology. Um, you could get public interest without that. You might think that, uh, well, the best way to really ensure it is in public interest is to look at methodology. But um, yeah, it's not clear to me whether DACs are gonna be in a good position to evaluate that methodology. It's gonna be more straightforward to say, here's our purpose, here's the end, here's how society will be improved by our results. To actually say, here's our you know, method of data analysis, here's, here's the, the tests we're gonna do on it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if DACs are, you know, first of all, it's very in the weeds. Um, I don't know if DACs are well-placed to really do that evaluation. So I think, I think we could retain a public interest test without necessarily going all in for a validity um, assessment, but this is something that we will be thinking about in this, in this project I mentioned, and it was flagged to us recently, actually by, by Julian Savalescu, to look at the um, issue of scientific validity in the course of public interest tests and whether or not that, that fits in. Okay, uh, we are just at time. Um, so sorry, I went a bit o o over time from what I anticipated. I'm um, always happy to field questions via, via email or follow up um, as uh, as required. Again, this session will be, is, be, is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel and we'll, we'll post that and circulate that link when it's available. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'll, um, hopefully I'll see you all again in two weeks. Uh, again, uh, Jerry Manikoff, Dr. Jerry Manikoff and Dr. Sumitra Menon will be presenting on uh, undue inducement uh, payments and incentives, uh, which would be a very interesting set of discussions around the evolving uh, current bioethics literature in that area. Hopefully see you all in two weeks. Bye-bye.